and socialists helped to transform labor into a global working class movement to prepare for the revolution. Uh, hi, comrades. I don't know how much I'm going to answer that question. That, that, that's a question that's posed to everyone. That's a question that's really just posed to the working class movement, especially all those who consider themselves in the vanguard. You know, um, I, 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 I think it's germane to our discussion. Uh, this is part of an ongoing discussion that the party will need to have on assessing what are the challenges for our class, what's working in our favor uh, as we go forward in this very tumultuous uh, but nonetheless profound period, the dying of capitalism. Uh, there are a lot of good things happening. For those of us who can't wait until capitalism is in the grave uh, and, you know, just hope that we'll be around to see it, there is. Uh, it's important to point that out. Uh, socialism is more popular, more talked about than ever before. We've said this, be it, but it's, it, it bears repeating again. Some of you may have noticed that the New York Times, right up front in there, uh, uh, hard copy has a uh, uh, a notice uh, is socialism the future of the left and and it's a discussion between the head of uh, or the editor of Jacobin magazine and a bunch of their own bourgeois uh, columnists I, I haven't heard it so I can't really comment on it but just the fact that the New York Times has to put that that shows you it's, it's a sign of, of the period you have a lot of young people a lot of millennials who are identifying as socialists of one type or another. Um, uh, part of what we're doing or part of what we need to do is to continue to discuss what's the best way of attracting the best elements. Uh, those who are not only relating to socialism but are relating to the goal of socialist revolution and, and all that that means. There are many, many labor strikes by comparison to a couple of years ago. It's actually quite a big deal. Uh, I'm not going to try to go over them uh, except to say that they are occurring on every continent. And what's significant is that it's the same section of the working class in many instances. The education workers that started this in West Virginia a little more than a year ago, that's gone viral. Now, now you've got education workers striking in Brazil, in Honduras, uh, in I, every, every continent, every continent. And it's all connected. They're in touch with each other. You know, it's not just a coincidence. They saw that the workers here could do something and they kind of said, you know, what the F, why don't we do it, you know? I think we'll see more and more of that. Uh, the question of workers exercising their power when they strike, uh, that's something that's in vogue, that's being talked about a lot. Uh, even the question of the general strike, I think we're going to be coming back to that and talking about it a lot. You know, there are different interpretations of what a general strike is. Is it uh, you know, the most traditional definition? You know, when workers who are working somewhere, you know, leave, put down their tools, leave their workplaces, deprive the capitalists of their labor, you know, at the means of production. Certainly a big part of it. Are, are, are we moving into broader, more inclusive definitions of a general strike? Uh, such as uh, Palestinian comrades who, you know, they, whether they're working or not, they just shut everything down. They shut shit down, you know. Uh, and the same is true in, in, in many, uh, the, the tradition in many uh, working class movements where whether you're working or not, you shut everything down. You occupy squares. And, and, and that's a general strike. And, and so it, there, there are no boundaries between those who work, those who are not working, 
uh, and, and all the other boundaries that we're constantly dealing with. Um, I noticed that uh, the, I think it's the Women's Feminist Caucus of the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, I think we'll probably be talking about them and what our approach should be to them because uh, at least on paper they've got 60 plus thousand people. Uh, some of them may be uh, not very socialist in our view, uh, but others of them may have a lot of potential. And the reason why they joined DSA is because probably when they Google socialism, that's the first group that comes up. But what, what was intriguing about the, and they have lots of caucuses. I, I think in time we should know more about their caucuses and interact with them, you know, because we can win some. Uh, the Women Feminist Caucus voted to propose to the entire DSA that they organize a general strike to defend reproductive rights in response to all the attacks on reproductive rights. Now, whether they can do that or not, you know, that remains the question. But it's a sign of the time that some radical somewhere would think of what? A general strike as a way to respond to something. You know, I, I, if, if we had the time, I'd be for the party discussing it and maybe coming up with a view or being part of the discussion in our paper, seeing what people think about it. Uh, uh, similarly, the young people who have been coming out uh, on a lot of Fridays, including the recent Friday, uh, around the world against climate change. Some of them are more radical than others. Some of them say system change, not climate change. Uh, others are more tied to bourgeois politics. But I mean, it's tremendous what they're doing. I, I, I think we're all aware of it, but we haven't had much time to talk about it. Uh, they are calling for a global general strike in September, in late September, you know. And uh, it behooves us to pay a great deal of attention to that. Uh, is it real? What is their definition of a general strike? What does that mean? Uh, uh, women have tried to have a couple of general strikes recently, and there's been debate in the labor movement over whether that's a real general strike or not. The party should be a part of this, this debate. Uh, one of the reasons why I think the, uh, the global climate strike would be of great interest to us as socialists and communists and, and those who are oriented toward the workers because, well, for one, <laughs> we want to save the planet too. <laughs> and, and that's no small thing. Some of us who thought that this was a petty bourgeois issue, and I, I include myself, you know, a, a few years ago, I mean, we, we don't consider it that anymore. No, it never really was. You know, it's just that the character of some of the people in the leadership was that we don't care if the police are beating you up or you're being thrown in jail or, you know, uh, black people are under attack or oppressed people are under attack or women and LGBTQ2 people are under attack. We're leaping ahead and talking about the climate. And it sort of seemed like a very privileged thing at the exclusion of all the other social uh, and class issues and issues of oppression. But somebody's got to bring all of the other issues to that struggle because that struggle is only going to get bigger. And the question that we have in this continuing discussion is what role will we play? What role will we play as a party? What role will some of the mass groups that we're involved in play? Um, but we also have very serious problems uh, that are facing our class. There's danger facing our class. Uh, we can't resolve it. Uh, certainly a small group can't do it. It involves, you know, like, in, you know, enlarging the circle of advanced elements who are talking about this. And it will take time. But uh, we have to live in the real world uh, and open our eyes. What has history taught us? When there is an out-of-control capitalist crisis, and I think that the capitalist crisis is reaching that level. I'm not going to go into that. That's an educational piece. Uh, uh, you'll have to take my word. And I, I think probably most of us agree to one extent or another. When the ruling class is worried about this, 
in order to change the subject and by all means available hold on to their system and class rule they will resort to extreme measures repression not to mention all the economic oppression austerity union busting but state repression especially against the most oppressed and then against the less oppressed war war is always there as a solution for the capitalists to get out of their crisis fascism fascism light fascism middle fascism you know the whole banana you know whatever uh, these are the kind of things that our class are facing uh, when you look at Trump and you try to understand his election you have to see both sides of the coin on one side his election is a, a sign that if they elected a guy like this capitalism must be in a lot of trouble you know on the other hand whether he's a fascist and a racist and a white supremacist which he is down to his bones he's using fascist methods these attacks on reproductive rights state to state to state these are fascist measures some in the left may want to argue with us about terminology but I think we got to just I think we got to blaze now and when we say fascist we don't mean that so people could run to the Democratic Party the Democratic Party especially their bourgeois leadership is not going to save us from fascism organizing our class on a global basis for socialism is going to do that the attacks on immigrants are fascist they have little to, and nothing to do with real economic issues it's complete scapegoating not only here but around the world Teresa is going to talk a little more about that some of you may have noticed you know that I think it's just the last two days Trump on top of everything else has threatened uh, uh, tariffs on Mexico actually some of the ruling class is freaking out especially those on the market because they say what are you talking about this is good I mean the markets already bouncing back and forth and about to crash this is just gonna make it more fragile you know which underscores the, the politics of it it has nothing to do with real economic issues it's to mobilize as much of society in this country against the immigrants in other words it's another fascist measure there's conservatism in the organized labor movement comrades who may know better than me say it's changing and it is and uh, a lot of examples uh, can be made of that but that does not negate the underlying problem the organized labor movement in this country as well as in the other imperialist countries I mean there's differences between them uh, that are nuanced important but nuanced they are tied to the bourgeois parties they're tied to capitalism this limits them this limits their orientation to a large extent they're afraid of the masses especially the most militant ones which is why the leadership is usually not where you get calls for strikes and general strikes it's the rank and file like with the teachers and other sections of our class who are the ones who are pushing for a fight back what do we do about that how do we fight the leadership of the labor movement but not break with it like some other groups do you know get so angry that they go too far and before you know they're they're attacking unions as being reactionary which is a place that we don't want to go so what have we been doing in our discussion for a number of months the party has been talking about some initiatives that we could take that we feel could be a partial answer to the worry of the breakdown of solidarity amongst the workers chopping up workers and dividing them on the basis of racism neo-fascism attacks on women on LGBTQ and other things part of that is a discussion of a worker solidarity day uh, an idea of having like a May Day but not every year one every month uh, 
also forming an international worker solidarity network, uh, which we're in the process of doing. As some of you know more than others about this. I can tell you that hundreds of people have joined, many organizations have joined. Uh, in this country, we have people who are members of the IWW, members of PSL, uh, members of the Communist Party, uh, several other parties, the Socialist Party, even some leaders have actually signed on to the network. And some uh, migrant workers organizations, some worker centers, uh, anti-war groups. It's quite impressive. And around the world, it, it's, it, it's at least 40 countries now that we've got some people who are responding to it. We've got a long way to go, a long way to go. What we have found out is that if any of us thought it was going to be easy, clearly it's going to take some time for us to establish in some kind of serious way, as distinct from a symbolic way, a May Day every month. Uh, we're discussing changing our tactics. Should we try to have a May Day every month? Is that too ambitious right now? Should we be working toward that? Maybe should we try to have a theme for every month, you know, a, a theme for this month, you know, might have been, you know, solidarity with LGBTQ2 workers because it's Pride Month, 50th anniversary. Uh, instead, uh, uh, we declared it solidarity with immigrant workers for obvious reasons that the attacks just keep coming, you know. Maybe in July, we'll think about gig workers, the, the lift workers, the workers who went on that tremendous attempt at a global strike a few weeks ago. Uh, we're trying to find out what works. Uh, our biggest response, for example, even bigger than the response to joining a worker solidarity network, is when we organized activities in solidarity with the Uber and Lyft strike on May 8th. The responses that we got on social media to that were 100% uh, uh, more. And why is that? It's not like we have a scientific analysis of it, but this much seems clear. Good ideas are great, but they're kind of abstract. When there's a struggle, people go, yeah, right. Support the lift workers, support the Uber workers. You know, so, you know, we're learning. You know, so maybe we'll be more oriented towards supporting actual struggles that are taking place uh, and say a lot of good political things and have a lot of demands and good information, but that will be like the dressing. You know, we gotta find things, we gotta find workers that are on the move and support them. Um, we've done some good activities here in, the, in New York. The Laundry Workers Center, which is unique, I think they're not only unique in this area, they're probably unique in this country because they're unlike some of the workers center who for, you know, uh, uh, understandable reasons are reliant on NPOs, on funding, sometimes from unions, and, and that's good, but sometimes that can put some moderating constraints on them. The better ones try to get around it, but the laundry workers center I mean, while that they welcome contributions, but as a matter of political policy, they will not trade their politics for funds. That's very bold, which means they can be as militant politically and in their activities as they want to be. This is unique, and they're doing tremendous work. And right now, with this idea of a worker solidarity network, we're beginning more and more to partner with the Laundry Workers Center. Uh, I, I would bet that the next thing we do in New York will probably be with the Laundry Workers Center. But that doesn't exclude uh, um, the uh, 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 MTA, uh, People's MTA. You know, there's been a lot of talk about what can we do to help that. Can the People's MTA become part of it? Uh, the PPA has been supporting worker solidarity activities. We've got people from the PPA here, so they'll be a part of it. Other organizations may want to join. Uh, uh, Gabriella, Bion, uh, other trade unionists. I could go on and on and on. Um, one of the things that I think if we're ready, we should talk about today is are we ready 
to begin forming a local worker solidarity network. I think there is a sign-up sheet that we're going to send around for people who are interested in doing that. Uh, uh, understand this, it won't be just the people here, but hopefully some people here will be there to sort of get it going. There, there already have been some comrades around the country and comrades in New York who have been studying this and we, we've gone to a certain point, but now we need to bring in more people. Uh, comrades in Philadelphia told some of us a few days ago that at their next meeting, they're going to form a Philadelphia Worker Solidarity Network. You know, I, I don't want to preempt com, uh, uh, Comrade Teresa, but she, she had an idea and it sort of gives you, it gives you an idea of how the Solidarity Network wants to be both in terms of its politics and its issues inclusive as opposed to being east, exclusive. Some of you know about fire. Can fire be a component of the Worker Solidarity Network? That's the, that's the direction. That's the, that's the way that we should be thinking. There may be an LGBTQ2 uh, group that, you know, well, can we be part of it? Can there be a special component? The same thing for migrant workers. The same thing for sex workers. The same thing if gig workers want it. You know, th when that begins happening, then you know that the leaves are sprouting on the tree and it's coming to life. Uh, so I'll, I'll end here. Sorry for uh, being so long. Any, in my view, this discussion is open both to practical considerations, what are we going to do next, you know, how are we going to get this organized, but it's also open to political questions. You know, they, they had uh, elections in Europe. Uh, some of us have been very impressed by what the Yellow Vests have been doing in France now for the better part of a half a year. I mean, Macron and his French bourgeoisie, they're worried about revolution. They've actually brought the army in to patrol the streets the first time in almost 100 years. They didn't even do that in 68, you know? And some of us know more or less about, you know, what's happening in Europe, both good and bad. There were elections last year, I mean last week. The bourgeoisie, from their point of view, thought they weren't too bad. But I'll tell you, danger signs, Trumpism in Europe, the neo, not, the neo fascists in France, they poll the most. Maybe not by too much, but the neo fascist party, Le Pen's party, they got the most at the polls. The same's true for the in, in Italy. The neo fascist party got the most polls. The same is true in 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 England, the Brexit party, and and Hungary and other places. This is Trumpism, on a global basis. So. You know, we see the opportunities, we see where workers are on the march, but we also see the danger, you know. Uh, I, I hope that move, uh, going forward, we can sort of have a culture in our discussion where even if we're talking about local activity, we're seeing it in an international context. It's difficult to do that. But I think as revolutionaries, we have to try. Uh, that, that climate global strike, when are we going to sit down and talk about that? Anyway, that's it, comrades.